This is a film of our recent series of talks at Wilderness Festival in the UK. So Rebel Wisdom took over the main talk space for three hours with a series of guest speakers. So we talked about the death of empathy online with Aisha Akanbi. In the paradigm that we live in right now, there is such a focus on everything that is happening externally and, and being socially aware. Because I, can, I think that's what the word woke is trying to point to, is to be awake to what's happening socially um, and externally, but we're not so self-aware. So we have social awareness, but we're no self-awareness. And this is a very corrosive place to be. The flip side of activism with Anthea Lawson, now I've done all kinds of things that could be called activism over 20 years. What I want to talk about is the superiority and the righteousness, because that's what this discussion is about. The very way that righteousness works is it's making ourselves feel better at the expense of someone else who is wrong. There's a comparison built into it. We're not just feeling good in a self-arising way. We're feeling good because somebody else is wrong. And what that's doing is locating the problem somewhere else. It's nothing to do with us. Psychedelics and culture with Robin Carhart Harris. It's so exciting. I, I think it's sort of spine tingling exciting to think that we can go into a space that's so unknown, really. I mean, what is that? If we could understand the biology, the nature of the spiritual experience, that ground, grounding experience and uh, I think that will deepen our appreciation of it. And sense-making and the big tech platforms with Alex Krasadomsky. Democracy is compromise over a common reality. And I think what the digital age has done is challenge both halves of that. It, we have lost the tools and the capabilities to compromise. And we have lost that ability to form any kind of sense of a shared reality. This is a short cut down of the talks. The full three hours is in the members area of our website. A lot of the big themes we're going to be covering, so many of them relate to who we are as people um, and what it takes to become a different type of person. So that's something we've been fascinated about, Rebel Wisdom, right from the beginning. So, yeah, I mean, some of the topics that we've covered are the big questions of what goes in the place where religion used to be, um, how are we being kind of exploited by our tech devices, by the sort of underlying system of the way that business works, the way that tech works, the way that the market works. And on that journey, we've picked up a few concepts and ideas that we think help make sense of the world. Yeah, and by picked up, we mean we've spoken to really, really smart people and then nicked their ideas. Um, but we, yeah, so that is, you know, we're really curating some, well, rebellious thinkers. Today we've got a series of speakers who are going to be talking about different aspects of all of these different problems and trying to sort of pull up heart over the next three hours or so. And the central theme and why we were asked to do this is how has COVID, the pandemic and everything that it's accelerated made all of these problems worse? All of these problems were already there, but they've been catalyzed by COVID. This sort of sense of like ongoing online wars about misinformation, where sort of misinformation, disinformation takes on like an actual kind of health impact. It's sort of really accelerated it. Like, would the storming of the capital have happened without the pandemic? That incredible image of the QAnon shaman in the middle of the Senate, like that more than anything, I think, shows like the eruption of the irrational into the center of the rational. And our, our kind of core belief is we're gonna see more of this because essentially the irrational is always there. We've kind of, we tamped it down for most of the last few decades, but now because of especially decentralized media, it's coming out again. It was always there, but we were kind of able to ignore it. We're no longer able to ignore it. So the sense is we have to deal with it. We have to integrate it. And that's kind of going to be the process of the next few decades. Yeah. And so the, yeah, so the talks we're going to have today are just, just a kind of, exploration of how do we make sense of this and what are some of the tools that we need to and ways of having conversations that help us deal with the complexity that we're all living through um, and a big part of what we do at Rebel Wisdom is run courses and retreats based around that based around what are the in, what are the cognitive tools we need what are the emotional conversational tools that we need to be able to um, figure out like what the fuck is going on and once we've done that what should I do about it and how do we come together 
and have a real conversation about topics that very often we just, they feel too hot or we don't really want to touch them. And it's that sense of how can we start to have different kinds of conversations? How can we start becoming much more aware of what we're bringing to the conversation? How can we be aware of how we're being kind of manipulated, especially, I'll keep coming back to like the big tech platforms because the whole way they work is by mining our consciousness, by mining our attention, by keeping us in, in what we know, like rewarding our confirmation bias, making me think we're, we're always right, even though we're not. Um, and so these, and this sense that the world itself, we can't even really perceive the problem because these platforms warp the world around us in a way that we can't actually even perceive what's going on a lot of the time. And we'll come to that in a second with our first guest, Alex, who's disappeared. <laughs> Alex, amazing. Uh, Alex Krasodomsky from Demos, who's been thinking about these problems of like the tech platforms and the information landscape for a very long time. So we'll come to him in a second. And after Alex, we have, we're then going to look at like what, are, what is the, inter if that's the external, what's going on in, in culture, what's the internal? Like what are our biases? What is the kind of lack of empathy that we really see online? And so we have Aisha Akambi to talk about that. And after that, we're going to look a little bit more about how some of the problems to make all of this better often make it worse. So we have Anthea Lawson, author of The Entangled Activist, to talk about that. Yeah, and then after that, we're going to be exploring psychedelics a little bit, conceptually, not uh, actually. But um, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that I've been very interested in, which is how psychedelics are entering the mainstream, both economically and culturally. And then we're gonna, uh, I'm going to have a dialogue with uh, Robin Carhart Harris, who's a pioneering psychedelic researcher, uh, one of the, the most influential out there. So, without further ado, we're going to move into problems of sense making with Alex Krasodomsky. Alex, how important do you think this particular topic is and how, where does it reach into? So we're talking about tech platforms, we're talking about, but is it bigger than that? Uh, so, uh, personally, I think it is. Now, I, uh, democracy means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, and I think the internet and its relationship with democracy is, um, is equally a, a very challenging subject for a lot of people. You know, many people have found a voice online, others haven't. I, it's funny, we, we, it's, it's 2021 now, so 10 years ago is, it's 10 years ago in February, more or less, uh, to the Egyptian Revolution. Um, so I, I don't know if, if anyone here remembers the sort of site of smartphones and Twitter in Tahrir Square. There. You were I there. Was, I was in Tahrir Square, yeah. Right, and so... I mean, that must have been an amazing experience, but I, I wonder if you can remember what, what, were your, what was your emotional reaction to, to seeing smartphones and seeing the role of social media played in Tahrir Square? I can remember it being the first time that... I mean, I've got a selfie of myself with that. Um, the people... I can't remember what it said. The, the people will not be... I have to remember what exactly what it said. I checked my Facebook; it's on there. Um, but yeah, this sort of—it was the first time I'd had a smartphone. I remember work gave me a smartphone, probably like just before I went out there. So it was, yeah, it was the first time. And the hero of that revolution was um, Gail Whale Gonim, the, the Google executive, who was basically kind of became a kind of hero of the Egyptian revolution because it was so so online. And I, I think for many observers, especially in the West, Tahrir Square was a real moment of hubris, uh, a real moment of hope. This was uh, Twitter and Facebook and Google as the vanguard of democracy spreading through the world. We'd kind of got it sussed here in the West, everything was all good, and now off the, on the back of these tech platforms, uh, you know, the end of history was coming, this time on the back of, of Twitter and Facebook. And obviously, 10 years has passed and how far that narrative has changed. We might call it the tech clash. So democracy means an awful lot of different things to a lot of different people. And for me, democracy is compromise over a common reality. And I think what the digital age has done is challenge both halves of that. We have lost the tools and the capabilities to compromise and we have lost that ability to form any kind of sense of a shared reality. And I think that really speaks to the problems that you were raising at the beginning of the talk. I, I mean, the Arab Spring, I remember that as a trajectory of sort of this, especially Tahrir Square when, when Mubarak went. And like I, I was there on that night with Channel 4 News. I was with Jon Snow, where we were broadcasting live from Tahrir Square as he left. The whole place erupted. And it was like 
Egypt have won the World Cup times 10. A life-changing experience being in something like that. And that sort of sense of, of then how dark it got in Egypt after that. I remember the, when the, the generals took over again and like the real sense of people who'd been through that of like, oh, this sense of a really dark trajectory, which kind of echoes the trajectory of the social media platforms in a way, this sort of like silicon utopianism that came out of psychedelic culture. And we had Douglas Rushkoff talking about this, and he beautifully summed it up, that originally a lot of it was fueled by psychedelic culture and kind of the nerds who created the internet, but then eventually it got kind of taken over by these bad incentive structures, and he said... Um, Silicon Valley took a tr uh, Silicon Valley took acid, and we're, now we're all having a bad trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but I think that's that, that's a sort of crucial part of it, right? Like, who are the people, the architects of the internet as we understand it at the moment? You know, they are an extremely small group of. Uh, people working towards a shareholder incentive. You know, that really explains where our political uh, and frankly social and cultural information space really comes from at the moment. If you think about Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and now increasingly, you know, a few platforms coming in who aren't Silicon Valley based, TikTok and so on. Um, these are the products of a tiny, tiny handful of people who are basically, at first, they sort of had a bash, move fast and break things was what they sort of told us they were up to and we sort of said oh okay that sounds really exciting but you know we get to talk to our nan or whatever on facebook and that's really you will put them back together again won't you <laughs> and 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 then it then it changed and google and facebook and many of these platforms went through the same story of like how on earth do we make this profitable and it turns out you can't just make it profitable you can make it absurdly profitable we we we, we probably can't sort of find a solution for this in the next five or ten minutes or whatever. But if I was to point people towards one solution that you guys can all be part of is to think about this in terms of power. Uh, one of the reasons I think Facebook is... Uh, like, you, you, can, you tend to be able to do this with, with, with an audience. So like, uh, I don't know, ha like, hands up if you have a Facebook account. Right. Hands up if you're proud to have a Facebook account. It, it's a massive difference, right? There, what, what, Nobody's, nobody has a sense of pride from having a Facebook account. Nobody takes pride in, uh, in, in what, they, what, what, what they have on these social media platforms, right? This is so, now, that's so different to like, communities in the offline world, right? Like You might take some care about you know, your front garden or maybe even your local community if you're that way minded, or the street when the ice sets in and you, you, know, you chuck your soul out, your grit out, uh, or whatever. You, know, you, have to take, you, you have the power to take some responsibility for your community. Now, Facebook is not built like that. It's changing bit by bit, but it's fundamentally built with power centralized right at the top. Think about what happened on YouTube, to take you another example, with your video. They removed your video. Do you know why they did it? Do you know who did it? No. Do you know when or what, like how know that when. decision was taken? <laughs> how that decision was taken, why no. it was repealed, right? We have and, they, and they also put it back up, and I don't know why. Right, there's no transparency in this problem, and also you have no recourse. You, you were able to, to appeal one way or another, um, but I would say that's, you know, perhaps as you sort of indicate a result of the profile that you have that allows you to speak to YouTube directly. Now, the average person doesn't have that power. Now, that doesn't apply in other parts of the internet, and it doesn't apply in smaller parts of the internet. So if you have a WhatsApp group where somebody's being an asshole, tell them, take responsibility for that WhatsApp group. You know, so look for the opportunities online where you can move away from relying on the platforms to police things, um, and look for opportunities where you have the power to try to sort of shape them yourself. Alex, thank you so much. And now we welcome to the stage Aisha Akambi. Aisha, thank you, for uh, having you me. are a stylist and a cultural commentator. How do you feel about being called a cultural commentator? Um, it's definitely not a word that I personally used to describe myself. Um, I was just speaking on what I'm observing and talking about a lot what doesn't seem to be there. Um, if people perceive it as cultural commentary, um, I'm not offended by that. But I think what I'm trying to do is just um, look at what's missing, you know? Um, it's not political in my sense of things. Um, I'm just very interested in why we as people do what we do. And your kind of if people are familiar with any of your content here, it might be your film was called The Problem with Wokeness? Yes, um, so I think that's the first video where 
a lot of people got to know um, some of my thinking. And so that was maybe in 2018. Um, and I think I wrote a tweet. I think that's how that video came about. So I had a tweet that said, um, something I think like wokeness has replaced compassion with moral superiority. These are controversial topics. You talked about sort of woke, this whole sort of binary of woke, anti-woke that I think we're all pretty tired of. Mm -hmm. um, and the sense that, that I have or we have with, with Rebel Wisdom, a lot of the stuff that we try to cover is like, is there a synthesis beyond these binary positions? Because it's, it's boring. It's, it's, we, we've had it, and especially America is just so, which is the other interesting point of it is like, I think the other thing about the big tech platforms is we've all been swept up in America's culture war. Yeah, and it's much. not. It's and in some ways, it's not our fight. A lot of the terms don't feel like they're they're appropriate. A lot of the way that kind of the conversation happens. So I guess your focus is more on like how the conversation happens around that. And do you want to talk a bit more about? Yeah, about and, that? and so I would definitely never identify myself. I mean, in general, uh, most labels are, are not the way that I think of myself. I mean, there's some labels I'm not um, upset if people put on me, but anti-woke is definitely not a label that I'm, I'm happy to assume the position of. Uh, because I think once you become anti-anything, it becomes an identity and a religion of its own in many ways. Um, and in that, you can become quite dogmatic. And, you know, again, woke is the term, uh, the media term, it's what they call it. When I'm conceptualizing it and thinking, that's, I don't know if I have a neat term for it, but that's not what it is for me. Um, but yes, I am more interested in how we engage in the conversation. So for me, it's not that there are, that these ideas are necessarily wrong. I think in many instances, they're incomplete. I think it's an incomplete story. I think it's an incomplete story about who we are as people, um, about our identities, about our race, about our gender, about our sexuality. Uh, I think it's simplistic, but that doesn't mean untrue in every area. One of the key things for me is this sort of collapse into certainty. Like the sense of keeping curiosity and an exploratory mindset and not collapsing into certainty. And there's so much certainty on all sides around these topics in particular, but on kind of so many topics. And I get that sense with you that it's kind of an exploration and there's a real spirit. But what I love is that you're, you're coming from a place of empathy and, and pointing out a lack of empathy in some of these values that I think most of us share, but often can be kind of delivered in a way that lacks empathy or delivered in a way that is kind of creating a lot of the same dynamics that we're sort of trying to criticize in others. Um, yeah, respond to yeah. that. Um, for one, uh, I think about uh, the word and the term empathy a lot because it's thrown around all the time. And I think it's probably one of the most, to me at least, I would say it's one of the most misunderstood words online and there are a lot of misunderstood words um, but I would say that what people often consider to be empathy is selective sympathy and so I think people are because for me if you only can have empathy for one group of people then that's not empathy it might even be pity but it's not empathy I, I don't think I think people think empathy is trying to be um a good person, maybe it's something like that, where I see empathy as a tool to strengthen our thinking. You know, I see because if you understand how people feel, you have an under, a better understanding of what they're thinking. And so that's why, to me, it's better to employ empathy for people you disagree with, you know, because then you have a better chance of understanding the emotional roots of their ideas. Um, and so, yeah, I just think empathy is a very... Um, yeah, it's just a very uh, misunderstood concept. And yeah, I would like us to be, or at least I try to encourage uh, a more empathetic worldview. Because uh, what I seem to find is you scratch the surface and everybody feels like a victim somewhere. Everybody feels justified in thinking that they can hate someone else. And if you get to their emotional center, um, yeah, you can't really tell these people as to why they might be um, wrong in that sort of thinking. So I don't know, I just... I just think that empathy is um, a good way of helping us become clearer thinkers. I think I was looking for a level of self-mastery. I think I was looking for people who were not prepared to let the terrible things that have happened to them become a justification to do those things to other people. And that's actually quite rare. 
you know, and, and I realized actually this thing that I was trying to find in groups, whether it was the left or whether it was in some black nationalist identity or this or that, or it just wasn't there, you know, and this seemed, this thing that I was searching for is much more of a personal undertaking. And I feel that in the paradigm that we live in right now, there is such a focus on everything that is happening externally and, and being socially aware. Because I, I think that's what the word woke is trying to point to, is to be awake to what's happening socially um, and externally. But we're not so self-aware. So we have social awareness, but we're no self-awareness. And this is a very corrosive place to be. Since we've um, kind of been speaking to each other for a year or so, and I think when I first talked to you, I expressed my concern because there's so many polarizing factors. A lot of what you're saying can be seen as supporting the anti-woke side, for example. Uh, and I've seen so many people get caught in that kind of dynamic because there are rewards, especially in America, there are rewards for doing that. And I don't see you as a political figure. And I think you've done pretty well not to be dragged into that. But I also could want to kind of ask, like, how do you protect against that happening if, if what you're saying can be kind of used or weaponized by others? If I was to self-censor based on other people's ignorance, then I would be putting myself in a, that would be a self-imposed prison. Um, and I can't do that for anyone. Um, and I think people who resonate and understand where I'm coming from get it, which is why we're here, because it, it seemed to clearly, something that I was saying made sense to you. Um, in terms of not getting pushed into the other directions or into directions that could be unhelpful, I think one thing that was beneficial maybe in that really traumatic experience that I had in 2012 when my brother passed away is like, I think I realized that fulfillment doesn't live in any of those places. Fulfillment doesn't live in fame and visibility and success and having a lot of followers. I have some of those things, definitely not the money side, and it, it means nothing, you know? Um, it doesn't, it's not fulfilling. If you're wise, maybe it can be useful, but it certainly isn't fulfilling. So they don't have, what I'm looking for is not what they can provide me. And so I'm quite sure of that. So I don't worry about it. Awesome. So you'll be coming back in about 20 minutes for a dialogue with our next speaker. Um, so say thank you to Aisha and she'll be back soon. The next person we have coming up is Anthea Lawson. And Anthea is a human rights and environmental activist, has been for many years. And she's got a book out called The Entangled Activist, which is about how activists often recreate the very problems that they're trying to solve. So please give a big round of applause for Anthea. Hello, everyone. Would anyone here say that they are an activist? OK, couple of hands, couple of them nervous. Would anyone say they've done some campaigning or activism at some point but wouldn't call themselves an activist? Yeah, a few more hands. Um, would anyone say they're trying to make the world better in some way, whether in your job or just in your life, um, but you wouldn't call yourself an activist? Yeah, quite a few. Has anyone been really pissed off or irritated by activists at any point? Yeah, a bunch of hands. Okay. Is anyone completely out of it already and no idea why you're in this tent? <laughs> you're welcome. Keep going. Keep going. You're cool. All right. So, yeah, so my name's Anthea and I'm an activist, or at least I've thought about myself as an activist for a long time. I've worked to try and get controls on the arms trade. I worked on the campaign, which was successfully... Uh, ended in getting an arms trade treaty, which was supposed to control the sale of weapons to countries that violate human rights with them, though it doesn't seem to have stopped the UK government from selling weapons all over the place. I've worked on the campaign to ban cluster bombs. Um, I've worked to stop banks fueling corruption um, in places where entire components of national budgets are disappearing into private bank accounts. But I'd like to tell you uh, a story to start with about a typical scenario in which I might have been doing activism. So we're in a negotiating room in Paris. It's in the basement of the OECD, which is a rich countries club, where they get together to cook up rules to control the financial system, 
uh, trade rules, most of it doesn't make the kind of news that most of us would read. It's happening behind closed doors. So the room is stuffed with bankers, lawyers, representatives of the offshore finance industry who run the tax havens, plus me. I'd lobbied the diplomats in charge for two years to get into that room. And so there I was. They did the go-round where everybody has to say who they are. We've got so-and-so from HSBC. We've got so-and-so from UBS. We've got so-and-so from Royal Bank of Scotland. All these European banks, all of these sort of lawyers kind of conglomerates that run the offshore business all the way around the room. And finally, it gets to me and I say, hello, I'm Anthea Lawson. I investigate what you lot do to cause corruption and fuel environmental devastation in some of the most impoverished countries in the world. And there's this sort of ripple around the room. And they're like, who the fuck let her in here? And I proceeded to be a massive pain in the arse all the way through that meeting. They have this sort of thing where they talk about corruption as a technical term. Everything is kept on this kind of technical surface. Um, they say things like, well, in order to prevent you know, something, we do, we do this and we do that. It's all very smooth and nobody is talking about what's actually going on. So when they were trying to keep the discussion to technicalities, I would intervene to point out that what's actually going on is women dying in childbirth and children dying for lack of clean water because of the massive capital flight that they are allowing. When they are saying, oh, these laws are quite enough, it's fine, we're bound by them, we are all very compliant, they do this little compliance dance, and I would be pointing out with specific details, naming their names, including pointing to them from our investigations, pointing out specifically the ways in which they had fueled corruption and had accepted specific instances of corrupt money. And you know what? I absolutely bloody loved it. I loved feeling righteous. I liked feeling superior. I enjoyed the feeling of discomfort that I was able to create, albeit temporarily, in these people. I'm sure as soon as I left, the ripple would close over again and they'd be back to their usual way of doing things. But while I was in there, I loved it. But look, the point here is not really to go on about that. I've done a TED talk about it. You can find it online. What I want to talk about is the superiority and the righteousness, because that's what this discussion is about. All these different forms of activism and the thing that runs throughout them I've never not seen it present, is that feeling of superiority. We know better. We're not asleep. We're right. They're wrong. Why don't they get it when we do? Now, the obvious problem with this approach is it pisses people off. None of us like it when other people are being righteous. It's extremely irritating. But actually, there's a much bigger, well, a deeper problem with it when it comes to how activism works. I think actually it's a failure to correctly locate the problem because what we're doing when we're being righteousness, like the very, the very way that righteousness works is it's making ourselves feel better at the expense of someone else who is wrong. There's a comparison built into it. We're not just feeling good in a self-arising way. We're feeling good because somebody else is wrong. And what that's doing is locating the problem somewhere else. It's nothing to do with us. So we used to say, yeah, let's go get those bastards. You know, I'm off to give some bankers a kicking. And that all feels really good. And these, these ways of relating to other people that are about dominance, they actually go quite deep into our way of being. And so, of course, they emerge when we're trying to change the system. These ways of relating to other people and thinking that we're better than are baked into political and economic systems that are causing inequality and injustice that we're trying to change. So I think we kind of all need to look at our own will to power. And the problem with activism is it goes into shadow. We don't want to look at it because we've identified ourselves as the good ones because everyone else is wrong. There's a, there's a psychoanalytic way of understanding this. The idea of the shadow, the, this kind of Jungian idea of the shadow, which is that there's a part of us that we don't, we don't want to be dealing with it. It's the part of us that gets repressed. It goes into our unconscious. It's the things that we've been told we're not allowed or society tells us we're not allowed or we don't like about ourselves. They go out the way. And activism can be really good cover for that because we can kind of burnish our purity and good credentials and put that stuff out the way. And what happens with the shadow, in fact, the advice for finding our own shadow, because it's quite hard to know what it is, the very nature of it is it's gone, is to try and work out, try and notice who's really pissing you off like beyond 
what they should be. Because, of course, there are always annoying people out there. But the people that really get at you might well be um, embodying the aspects of you that you've put away from yourself. And so what the activists are doing is projecting onto everyone else the things that they're not comfortable in themselves. I've been collecting definitions of activism that kind of open it up and open up different ways of seeing it. And one of the ones I really love is Alice Walker. And she says, activism is the rent I pay for living on the planet. And this opens up an idea for it as, this is about being human. Um, and so I think this conversation we're having is really, really needed because there are massive problems with what is happening in the confrontations around activism. And at the same time, I don't think it's um, a call for us not to be doing something, whether or not we call it activism, because the stakes are too high. All right, I'm Anthea Lawson. I'll be signing copies of my book, The Entangled Activist, in the book tent over there. We are now going to have a discussion between our last two guests, Anthea and Aisha. You mentioned the shadow. Um, is everyone familiar with the concept of the shadow, like the Jungian idea? I mean, I guess, it, I guess it's been popularized over the last few years. And I know it's another interest that, that yeah. you have. We talked about when we first did the interview. Yeah, for um, sure. So I wonder if there's a kind of common thread there to pick up on. Yeah, well, I, I guess, um, you know, when I first started conceptualizing a shadow in my own mind before, before coming across Jungian's work, because I think when I went through my own experience that was very transformational. Part of what made me interested in, let me call it the basement, I mean, our own basement of horrors, if you like. Part of what allowed Should me- Should we just say what the shadow is just so everyone's on the same? Okay, so I, the, I forgot to- Yeah, so I, well, I imagine, or, I mean, you might have a, a, a clearer articulation of it, but I see the shadow as our, our subconscious, you know, what is, in, what is hidden in our subconscious that's maybe our darker matter. I don't know if that would be a, a way to describe it. So we all have a shadow. So this is things that we are not conscious of, but do inform our behaviors either way. And so our shadow might be informed by things that have happened to us as children. It might be informed by things that we don't want to look at because we've assign some value judgment to them. Um, but the problem is when you don't acknowledge what's in your shadow, and we all have one, um, these things, they build and they nurture themselves and they come out, they leak into your, your good deeds um, in the world. Um, and so that's why I've always been interested in the shadow, mostly because when I went through my own transformation, I realized I was not what I thought of myself. And some of that was not quite positive. And I think when I saw that side of myself, it was very unsolicited. I wasn't trying to be self-reflective at that time. Uh, but when you see yourself in a, in a new light that isn't quite flattering, if you're interested, you can't help but act on that. And I wonder what you think. I ask everybody who's aware of the shadow concept, like, because I, you know, I'm, I don't know. Why are we so scared of the shadow? Why are we? Because I find it weird in the sense that everybody acknowledges that they're imperfect people. So we all know that on one hand that we're not perfect people. Everybody would admit that they have flaws. But no one believes that they have, um, I don't know, people, aren't, people don't self-reflect to that degree. And what, and what is that, do you think? I think of this as sort of the, um, the difference between known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, so the known unknowns are the bits that we like, yeah, okay, we know about that. I know I'm a flawed person. I know I do this. You know, it's like that annoying question in job interviews. It's like, well, what's your, you know, what's your worst characteristic? And you're like, oh, I work far too hard. You know, all that nonsense. Whereas the, un the shadow, what we're talking about here is the unknown unknowns. And when we don't know what something, you know, we like to know. It's this is here be monsters territory. You know, and the whole purpose of of all sorts of psychotherapeutic interventions, arguably, even in the broadest sense, they've all got different approaches, is to bring into the light those things so that we're no longer scared of them and they're no longer driving us in ways that, in ways that we can't do. Now, this is tricky, isn't it? Because we can't be sitting here advocating therapy for everyone because it's, it's expensive and it's not available and, and that's a problem. But I think we can encourage a more reflective culture and a culture that isn't in its very terms of discourse, putting the problem always onto other people. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah, and just, I think one of the ways of framing rebel wisdom is the sense that 
we are all going to have to go through shadow work as a culture because the nature of the media ecosystem. So you had, in the past, you had this sort of, you had the main channels, you had a very low resolution, you had gatekeeping, you had a kind of, we could all agree a narrative. There was a narrative that took us through probably from the end of the Second World War up until it started to fragment. And now it's really fragmenting under the kind of impact of alternative media, more viewpoints, which is a positive thing, but it's also deconstructive of that narrative. And it shows, so all the things, all the shadow material, like that we kind of were able to keep out with the grand narrative we had, that it never got into, we just gatekeep it up to the, out of the media, is now coming up and leaking out of the tra cracks because of the, the media revolution. Everyone has a voice. All of these perspectives that we were able to kind of say, no, that's, that's beyond the pale, there be monsters, is now coming up. So I don't see an alternative than actually doing that shadow work of looking at all the stuff we've repressed as a culture. I don't know what the fuck that looks like, but that seems to be what we're going to have to do. I think one of the other things that um, stops us looking at ourselves, I think this brings us into the other area that I really wanted to talk about with you, is the, the, the lack of meaning in our culture. I think one of the things, we don't want to sit still and be with ourselves because we might realise that there's a bit of a void that we're filling with the things we've been told to fill it with, with social media, with consumerism, with kind of being on the treadmill in all sorts of ways, whether it's, whether it's work or not. And, and that brings me to the question of, of spirituality and, and a sort of a spiritual disposition. Um, yes, yeah, so, okay, so, you know, uh, spirituality, you know, the big S word. I call it an S word sometimes because depending on the circle you're in, that word can go very different, you know? That word can mean all types of things. It can mean that you're not credible. It can mean maybe you smoke too much weed. I mean, for some people, it means all sorts. Um, but no, for me... So, with, you know, when I think about spirituality, so beyond uh, concepts like, I don't know, the third eye and chakras and all of this and all of that, um, I just see it as the removal of that which is false, fundamentally, you know, is the attempt to remove that which is false in ourselves, in our external worlds, in our relationships, in our families. And I think when we remove that which is false, whether it's interests, some of our interests aren't genuine, some of our interests are based on what we think we should do, based on our race, based on our gender, based on our sexuality, based on our idea of a good person, you know? And, and these things are false, and they um, stop us from um, confronting who we are. And I think when we can't deal with who other people are, I think it's often because we haven't dealt with ourselves. Um, and so I might have lost where I was going, I can go off on tangents. Um, but yeah, I think you guys get what I'm saying. I feel like the, um, the question of spirituality comes up for me in our, these questions about how we, how we change the world because another way of thinking about it is it's about how we are in relation to everyone and everything. You know, we can talk about non-human beings as well who is not us. Um, and if the basis of our relation to everyone who is not us is superiority whether that's we're dominating nature or whether we have to win in every interaction we're in through feeling righteous and being better or being pure or whatever it is, then that's going to get in the way of, of being in the fullness of ourselves yeah, yeah. as opposed to the alternative, which is to relate in a much more intersubjective way, which right. means we're kind of, we recognise... We recognise the connection. We recognise that we're all made by each other, ultimately. And I, and I, sorry, I've now brought myself back from the tangent yeah. now I, I remember what you were saying and so yeah I do think you know part of the issue is that many of us don't have a connection to something transcendent something beyond the material um, and I think when we don't have um, a connection uh, to something transcendent we start becoming religious about our beliefs you know, and, and that's when we get dogmatic and that's when we become um, very binary thinkers you know we're encouraging non-binariness in everywhere but our thinking you know, and this is the most important place uh, where we need to be. Um, and so, yeah, I think spirituality is the thing that grounds you. And we need a lot to ground us because everything is trying to pull us in, in every direction. Um, and so, again, spirituality for me, maybe I think 
the reason why I think it can be off-putting to people is because people think it has to do with religion or some kind of faith or, or meditation or things that sound very airy-fairy. And I don't think it has to do with any of that. I, I think it's just about, you know, most of the most spiritual people I know don't even know s spiritual concepts. You know, this is an embodiment. It's an embodiment for me. It's not, I don't even know many spiritual concepts myself, but I would say fundamentally I, I have a spiritual framework, you know, and, and that's just being prepared to not, to try and see people in their full humanity. I think that's even spiritual work. So we have reached time and all of our guests will be back in about half an hour for a Q&A panel discussion. Uh, we are Rebel Wisdom. This conversation was a fantastic example of what we're really trying to do, which is to bring a sort of deeper level of kind of understanding of psychology, of emotional drivers, like what is really driving us at a deeper level, and apply that to sort of cultural topics. So I'd like to thank Aisha and Anthea for this amazing conversation. And... Thank you. We will transition now to psychedelics. So now we're going to talk about psychedelics. This is uh, uh, the agents of weird, you might call them. Um, I've been involved in, in psychedelic activism in some capacity for the last 15 years or so and really watched the, um, the cultural conversation around them really, really change. And the way that psychedelics are now entering cultures is really through the lens of as potentially very powerful mental health medicines. We're gonna talk in a moment to uh, Robin Card Harris, who's been really at the forefront of uh, psychedelic research for a number of years. And I think there's two different strands of psychedelics that are relevant for the conversation we're having. One of the strands is this incredible potential they have to treat what is a mental health epidemic. You know, one in four people in the UK struggle with a mental health difficulty each year. That was before COVID. So post-COVID, it's really expected that that's gonna rise. And I think we all struggled with our mental health to some degree. But the, you know, psychedelics are being used to treat, you know, psychedelics like magic mushrooms, LSD, Iboga, are being used to treat very difficult disorders like long-term depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so, with that has come also a gold rush of investment and a gold rush of public interest. Psychedelics aren't the thing that heals us. The thing that heals us is psychedelic-assisted therapy. Otherwise, all we would have to do is drop some acid at wilderness and all of our trauma would be healed and we'd all be enlightened, uh, which doesn't happen. This is, just to finish on the, the kind of framing, this is what, what, what's happening in the psychedelic, as psychedelics enter the mainstream right now. We have this huge promise of psychedelics as mental health agents. We have this legacy from the 1960s as this kind of countercultural promise they might hold for transforming society. And we have psychedelic pharma companies floating on the stock market, some of which have a you know, market cap of a billion dollars. We have venture capitalists flooding the space. We have huge amount of interest from the general public. We have people investing money. We have people conducting amazing research. And right now it's kind of a wild west. And what I'm particularly interested in is where might it all go? Could psychedelics be the future of mental health care? Could they be the future of the way we start changing our own minds, getting past our cognitive biases? And so not to answer all those questions, but to answer some of them, I'm going to invite Robin Carhart Harris up. Now, Robin was recently listed in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2021, which I know he doesn't like it when people say too much, but it's, I think it's very, very impressive. And um, he's really been at the forefront of psychedelic research for a number of years. Robin, I thought that the first thing I wanted to ask you about is, I, re I remember years ago, I don't know when it was, but it might have been eight or nine years ago, seeing you talk about early research, I think at like the University of Greenwich, right? And now, psychedelics are in such a completely different place than they were. What, what has been your experience of that, that change? Gosh, well, 
It certainly has moved very, very quickly. And uh, maybe one major event that we talk about is the Michael Pollan effect, the book uh, How to Change Your Mind. And was that 2016, I think? I think yeah. roughly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, wow, that's five years on. And that five years has, has just flown by like it's six months or something. And uh, yeah, I, I think that, that added fuel to something that was already happening. Um, uh, his book was, I guess, largely based on the research, the uh, clinical trials, uh, the use of psilocybin specifically, magic mushrooms, treating end-of-life distress, anxiety, depression, our depression research at Imperial. Um, and uh, yeah, he caught a, a building wave in a way. And I think, I suppose, it, yeah, it has been like surfing that um, mm. over the last five years. It, it's, Seems pretty massive to me, but I'm in the inner circle in a way. So, is it big? I think it's big. I think it's, it'd be interesting to hear a little bit about the difference between how psychedelics help us treat depression compared to uh, an SSRI, selective, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, antidepressants, which is probably the way we most uh, we'd normally call them. So they're really, really different. Like the way that they work is really different. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to hear, yeah, hear a little bit about that. Well, in a sense, one of them is drugging you. I mean, you're drugged and because you're taking the drug every day. Um, and so that's the model. You're in a state of being under the influence of the pharmacological agent. And that's the antidepressant. That's the one that dominates mental health care now. With the psilocybin therapy, the sessions are just one or two sessions. Um, and it's much more about a psychological shift, a major psychological shift. But it's also sort of holistic as well. Um, it seems to translate into how people live their lives, their lifestyles change, their perspectives change in quite a fundamental way. Uh, this theme of, uh, we were hearing around spirituality and, and sort of, you know, uh, erasing the false in a way. That, that's kind of part of the model with, with psilocybin therapy. When it works, it's very grounding. It seems to provide insights that seem to arise sort of, of of their own accord. They're not put into the individual by the therapist. Or, um, they seem to arise in this fascinatingly organic way. And they change people's lives, you know. There was, there's a good reason why they're called psychedelic. It means if you want psyche revealing or soul revealing. Uh, and there's a good reason why Michael Pollan called his, his book How to Change the Mind. Maybe he should have said soul, actually. <laughs> but, uh, Just uh, also wanted to touch on, maybe, maybe in the last kind of couple of questions, we've been talking today about all the various problems we face, and in particular... The, the kind of, something that always comes out for me is like we need new ideas right now. We need new ideas to solve complex problems. And we also need ways to let go of bad ideas. Our kind of, our kind of rigid fixation on our own politics, our own ideology. And there's a correlate in, in some of your research around the default mode network, this area of the brain, and, the, and kind of the loosening, I guess, would be a word you could use of what happens in the brain when we take psychedelics. So be, be interesting to hear a little bit about what, what you've actually found in regards to that is happening in our brains when we take psychedelics. Yeah. We do need new ideas, but you know, so, some old ideas are um, kind of, in a sense, what psychedelics awaken people to, you know. Um, but the, the, the science, uh, I think it's, it's helpful. It, it's enriching, really, in terms of uh, our understanding of things. And the default mode network, uh, for those who don't know, is a particular system that is especially developed in the human brain. Uh, it's, it's a system that covers a lot of the brain, medial prefrontal cortex, and anyway, <laughs> a lot of it. Um, and yes, it's expanded massively in our species. It houses the, the sort of um, proteomic or in a sense molecular targets for the drug itself, these serotonin receptors, they're called serotonin 2A receptors, they're involved in something called plasticity, plasticity. 
gosh, um, which is the ability to change or be shaped or molded. Um, and they're also involved in brain growth itself. Um, so they've been linked to the evolution of the human brain quite recently. There's some compelling evidence to support that. Um, so yeah, these, this system, this human system, if you want, associated with analytical thinking, abstraction, imagination, all of those faculties that perhaps we have to a greater degree than other animals, I think it's fair to say, that breaks down. That breaks down. It sort of disintegrates as ego disintegrates under a big dose of a psychedelic. Um, and uh, the product of that effect is the psychedelic experience, is, you know, these uh, broadened awareness of self and other and nature and interconnectedness. And those are old ideas, you know. <laughs> so it's like humans, we think we've become so smart in a way with all that analytical thinking. And, uh, you know, uh, what you realize through the psychedelic experience is that the, the, the smartness is in that simplicity, you know, when you can wipe that, uh, that analytical, egoistic mind away for a, for a period. I mean, there's functions to the ego, but, uh, but uh, that's really the power, I think, in, in what they do. That's wonderfully said. Robin Card Harris, thank you very much. Get her. Thank you. So we're going to have a closing panel now. We've got a few minutes left, and I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, for a minute max, something that maybe one of the other panelists said or something that you're taking away from this today. Starting with, well, volunteering, so people can kind of... I'll, I'll go. For, I'll go. Yeah. Um, I've never taken psychedelics, um, but I feel like I had a really big psychedelic experience in 2012. Um, and I've somewhat been, uh, I think, somewhat close-minded about psychedelics because I've met a lot of people who take psychedelics who, yeah, I wouldn't say are very inspiring. <laughs> um, but no, actually, um, listening to uh, the neuroscientist, I forgot his name. Robin, yes. Um, yeah, he said a lot of things that um, I found really interesting. And I think maybe one of the, the reasons as to why I was somewhat close-minded about um, psychedelics is, um, yeah, I, uh, again, it's hard to sometimes find the right balance with any form of altered states of consciousness. Um, but no, I think, yeah, I, I, I can just say that I'm, I'm thinking more about it and I would um, like to have more conversations with him. Well, yeah, and you. <laughs> Yeah, happy to go. So, look, I, I'm, I'm leaving with a question, and it's a question that I don't have an answer to, so forgive me because I find it really difficult to express. But we've heard a lot about protest today and how difficult protest is. And I am left struggling to sort of square two things in my head, right? So everybody here has heard of cancel culture and how you can go on Twitter, and if you make a, uh, the wrong joke, your career is over because everybody is going to, uh, to, to report you and dogpile you and so on. And so you have almost two types of protests, one which seems absurdly difficult, one that is really challenging, similar to what, what the gentleman here was saying, something that requires a huge amount of human effort and, a, and an ability to sort of reshape your life around commitment to a cause, belief in a cause. And on the other, you have the Twitter mob and this other kind of protest that exists and is, is around us every day, which seems to also be hugely effective in, 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 in getting it saved, but it re apparently requires little to no effort on the part of those taking part in it. And I want to, I want to try to, uh, well, I, the question that I would like answered and one that I don't have an answer for today is how do you square those two things? Is protest hard? Or is it that certain kinds of protests are hard and certain kinds of protests are not hard? And are those two kinds of protests equally valid? Is the Twitter mob canceling Katie Hopkins as useful as uh, a Extinction Rebellion Act uh, uh, person, uh, you know, stopping a, f a flight leaving, on, or is that just an absurd comparison that we can never make? It's it's a question that I don't have an answer to, but yeah. So the thing that I was really struck by was you talking about um, compassion as the basis, and I think that answers in some ways what you're talk what you're saying there in that question, because if we ask ourselves before we take an action, am I doing this with compassion? 
or am I serving some of my own needs here? And when we sort of jump on in a pile on on Twitter, for sure, we're, we're, you know, we're meeting some of our own needs, you know, to look good, to feel right, to feel better, to have some status, to be part of the crowd, whatever it is, but we're not being compassionate. And I think it, I've, I've been really struck by that as a really fantastic guide to action. So thanks. So that is all from us. I want to say thank you so much to Anthea Lawson. Aisha Camby. Alex Krasadomsky. Robin Carhart Harris, who is not here right now, but was. You're tripping. You're tripping. He's not there. Um, so we are Rebel Wisdom. Check us out on YouTube. Uh, that's where we put most of our films. We also do podcasts. And yeah, we also run retreats and courses. So if you just Google Rebel Wisdom, not the Australian actress Rebel Wilson, you can follow her too, but uh, follow us at Rebel Wisdom. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed this little sample. All members can see the full films from all of our events. So to see the whole thing, check out our membership options and hope to see you soon. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>